Howdy, y'all. I'm Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Welcome to the Rapid Sequence Airway, or RSA, protocol review module. So we are introducing this protocol in conjunction with the Delayed Sequence Intubation, or DSI, protocol. If you haven't watched that video, please pause, go watch that first, because it helps put this one into context. This protocol is intended for patients we either don't have time to intubate with DSI, we can't achieve the physiologic preparation needed to proceed with DSI, or for whom you believe, for whatever reason, is not appropriate for DSI. In these cases, RSA will be the primary approach to invasive airway management. This is essentially an enhanced version of of the quick king or quick SGA concept we had in our old drug-assisted airway protocol. RSA can also be used in cases of failed intubation if needed. So in a nutshell, RSA is RSI, rapid sequence intubation, but for superglottic insertion instead of intubation. Now, in addition to ketamine, it authorizes the use of rocuronium for paralysis if needed for placement of an SGA. Now, with that in mind, let's go through the protocol. So basics, preparation, it's similar to any invasive airway preparation. Ensure that appropriate monitoring, including every two-minute blood pressure cycling, ECG and tidal CO2, and SpO2 is all in place. Make sure to place the pulse ox probe on the opposite arm from the blood pressure cuff because as it is inflating, blood pressure cuffs cut off pulses downstream. And, you know, as the name implies, pulses are sort of important for pulse oximetry. So let's make sure we continue to have them. It is amazing how easy this is to miss. I see it all the time in the emergency department. It just takes being methodical about making sure you're checking for this. Once you do it, it's not a problem anymore. Now, I want to be clear, there are no circumstances in which full monitoring cannot be established prior to doing an RSA. And to be clear, it is unacceptable to proceed with invasive airway management without full monitoring first. Okay, so you might be able to persuade me that you couldn't get pulse oximetry in a patient who had no chest, no hands, no feet, no ears, but... They have no arms or legs. Otherwise, my expectation is full monitoring prior to invasive airway management. I really hope I'm clear about that. I would want to live with no legs. How about no arms? No arms or legs is basically how you exist right now, Kevin. Now, basics should begin pre-oxygenating with either max BVM, non-rebreather mask, or CPAP as appropriate in addition to a nasal cannula, regardless of what other device is used. ALS should make sure that the patient has IV or IO access and prep push dose epi for use as needed. Now, like with DSI, I'm not saying you have to open the epi box, just be ready to. Now, if you think your patient is at risk for hypotension, for example, let's say they have a shock index greater than one, that's where the heart rate would be higher than the systolic blood pressure, go ahead and mix it up, get it ready. Otherwise, just get it out, have it handy. It's probably a good idea to quickly review how you're going to mix it up. If you need to give pressors or fluid, go for it. That's covered under the hypotension protocol. Now, you'll note that there are also additional sections in this protocol for both BLS and ALS. In other words, BLS and then ALS and then BLS again. That's because we're trying to maintain a sequence of actions in this protocol. And since BLS can perform supraglottic insertion, and I have no plans to change that, that's not changing, we place that after the ketamine and rocuronium administration at the advanced level. Same as for ALS, who can perform surgical airways if needed. Now at the advanced level, verify everything is in place in terms of monitoring and patient positioning. You know what I'm talking about here. Make sure that the bed is elevated, the head of the bed is elevated, and put the patient in sternal notch positioning when you can. Then, begin pre-oxygenating. Our goal is to provide as much pre-oxygenation as is possible. 
Now, I recognize that the whole point of RSA is to provide an avenue for invasive airway management when we either don't have the time to fully pre-oxygenate or we just can't get the SATs or blood pressure up. However, we should still make our best attempts at pre-oxygenating. We got to recognize we may not be able to achieve our physiologic goals of an SpO2 at or above 94% and a systolic above 100. I'm just asking with RSA that you do the best you can. Every bit you increase the SATs helps the patient. So this is a big difference between RSA and DSI. DSI, you are not allowed to proceed with intubation if you don't meet those goals. But if you can't meet the goals, we have to have an alternative. RSA is the alternative. Now, as with DSI, if the patient is spontaneously breathing and will tolerate max BVM, well, do that, but do it with a nasal cannula and both of these at flush rates. Just make sure you have a good seal and assure you have a PEEP at 5 or higher to assure that you have good oxygen flow. But you don't need to squeeze the bag to allow them to get oxygen as long as you have that PEEP on. Remember, you're not breathing for them here. You're just making a good seal and providing a higher flow oxygen than you'd be able to deliver with a non-rebreather mask, even a non-rebreather with a cannula. Now, if they're too awake to tolerate that, then it's okay to use a non-rebreather and nasal cannula because you're not giving them ketamine here to prepare it. Again, likely because you don't have time. Now, if they need assisted ventilations, by all means, assist them. Max BVM flush rate oxygen through the nasal cannula. Now, although you do have the option of placing an SGA without any medications for those patients who are profoundly obtunded, these are rare, very rare, and in most patients who are not in cardiac arrest, they're going to need some medication. If ketamine alone is sufficient, just go with ketamine, but if you feel ketamine alone is not sufficient, feel free to also give rocuronium. In this case, you are essentially performing RSI, but with a superglottic instead of an endotracheal tube. Ketamine is dosed at 2 milligrams per kilogram IV or IO with a max single dose of 200 milligrams. You can repeat that once as needed to place the supraglottic. Rocuronium, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram IV or IO, one time only. Now, these are the same doses for both adults and pediatric patients. Once you've given the rocuronium, wait 90 seconds before attempting to place the supraglottic to assure that it has had time to work. Ventilate is needed during this time. Again, if you need it, do it. You'll then place the supraglottic as usual. And this is described in the supraglottic um, insertion procedure. Be sure to confirm placement with waveform in tidal CO2 of at least 5 millimeters of mercury for at least 5 breaths. Nothing has changed about that. Once the tube is in place, refer to the post-invasive airway management protocol for ongoing sedation and analgesia. That's it. That's the protocol. But I do want to go over a couple questions I typically get around this concept. If we're doing RSA for supraglottic placement, why can't we do RSI for intubation? Well, you can. We're just using a safer version of RSI called DSI. This is one that is built around assuring you maximize the opportunity for a safe intubation and a first pass success without hypoxia or hypotension. Well, why supraglottic and not intubation? Well, intubation, regardless of how skilled the operator is, takes longer than supraglottic placement. It fails more often. There's more hypotension and more hypoxia associated with it. If we have to get a rapid airway in place, I want to use the one with the highest first pass success and the quickest placement and the fewest opportunities for the patient to decompensate. And that's a supraglottic. I understand they're likely going to swap out our SGA for an ET tube in the emergency department. 
That is the sound of inevitability. Please understand that is not in any way a reflection on your skills. If I were in the field, I would do the same thing. You are doing the right thing for the patient and having an SGA in place better prepares the patient for eventually intubating in the ER. So please, what you're doing, remember it's the right thing for the patient. Rule number one, as always, it's about the patient and not our egos. And finally, there are more resources in the ED to intubate this patient. There are lots of very skilled clinicians. There's a great environment. The head of the bed is elevated. Actually, the whole bed is elevated. Better light, better lots of stuff. We have more toys too. Now, the last thing I want to emphasize here is that I do not authorize the use of RSA or RSI for placement of an ET tube. Intubation is only done with DSI outside of cardiac arrest. If you do that, I really will have no choice but to view that as a decision, an intentional decision, and I'm just not going to tolerate that. Please don't do it. All right, another question. What should I do if I fail to successfully place a supraglottic during RSA? Well, first consider re-oxygenating with a mask and then attempting another supraglottic, but do something differently. A different size supraglottic, a different technique, a different clinician. Change something. Now, there's no magic number of how many attempts you have after a supraglottic, but after two, just like with intubation, I'm highly suspicious you're not going to be successful with a third attempt or a fourth attempt or a fifth attempt. Recognize that it's not working. Move on to something else. This is a distinction, though, with intubation. With intubation, there is a hard cutoff. And the Lord spake, saying... Two. Remember, the number shall be two. No more? Not three. With superglottics, there is not a max... I'm just asking on your judgment, recognize after two, you're probably not going to be successful. So if you're not successful, you're most likely going to go back to max BVM for the rest of the case in the event of a second failure. Again, at no point does this mean that you can then attempt an intubation without meeting the full DSI criteria and completing the checklist. Now, Finally, failure to place the supraglottic is not an indication for a surgical airway by itself. If and only if you are truly in a can't oxygenate, can't ventilate situation, are you able to proceed to surgical airway. If you can mask ventilate them, mask ventilate them, don't cut them. All right, another question here. What about those patients? We've all been there one time. At band camp, I had a patient with airway burns or angioedema or whatever other rare situation that does exist. I get that. Why, why can't we go ahead and intubate rapidly even if we can't properly oxygenate? Why force us to use a supraglottic? Well, the answer is there are far, far fewer of these patients than we think there are. And in almost all of those cases, we actually have time more time than we think we do. That whole concept of I have to intubate a burn patient quickly before the cords close forever, that's dogma and it has probably caused way more harm than good. We have more time than we think we do. Don't feel alone, by the way. Docs are also really bad at predicting which burns, which of these really, really rare things will also have the rare situation where they rapidly progress to airway compromise. Furthermore, many patients who are truly having massive and rapid edema are almost certainly, almost certainly going to have conditions that really, really need to avoid becoming hypoxic or hypotensive. So the balance between rapidly getting an ET tube through the edematous cords at the expense of profound hypoxia because we couldn't wait to properly prepare the patient really does not favor rapid intubation. So please just don't do it. Move on to a supraglottic. If it proves that it doesn't work and you can't manually ventilate with your best max BVM, then move on to a surgical airway. I have and will always support you if this occurs. 
Now, when we review these cases, you'd be amazed at how often a superglottic surprises us with our its ability to rescue a bad situation. If the superglottic is working, that's a win for us, and more importantly, it's a win for the patient. It can buy the patient the time they need to safely get to an emergency department that has more resources, more airway expertise, and more airway tools. All right, guys, that's RSA. Combined with DSI, that's our new approach to invasive airway management. As always, if you have any questions, concerns, or comments, please reach out to me. I really would like to hear from you. Thanks a lot, and take care.